honour and a privilege to welcome a distinguished guest and fellow volunteer to our Rotary Club of Adelaide. We are delighted to host Janet Weir, a devoted advocate and a driving force behind the Stroke Foundation's impactful incentives in Australia. As many of you are aware, the Stroke Foundation is at the forefront of the battle against stroke, tirelessly working towards raising awareness, providing crucial support services, advocating for policy enhancement and funding essential research projects. This multifaceted approach addresses not only the aftermath, but also focuses on prevention and a timely intervention ensuring a comprehensive strategy to combat this significant health concern. Today, we have the distinct pleasure of hosting one of the 160 dedicated volunteers from the Stroke Foundation, someone who epitomises passion and commitment uh, in the fight against stroke. Jeanette, through her involvement in the Stroke Safe Program, has been instrumental in community education about stroke prevention and recognition, particularly here in South Australia. Jeanette is on a mission to enlighten and empower Australians about the science of stroke, urging us all to recognise the importance of swift action in the face of this medical emergency. Her dedication and enthusiasm have not only made her an invaluable asset to the Stroke Foundation, but also a beacon of inspiration to all of us. Today, Jeanette will share insights on identifying common stroke signs using the FAST test. Her talk will equip us with the knowledge needed to be proactive in the face of stroke, empowering us to make a difference in our community. So, without further ado, let's give a warm Rotary welcome to Jeanette Wood. Close to you. And so, if 
good talk does make you feel upset or anxious, please make sure that you get in touch with somebody that you can trust and um, have a chat. Falling Stroke Line, which operates Monday to Friday on Eastern Standard Time, Standard Business Hours, and a qualified uh, medical person will have a chat with you on that line or call Lifeline. One stroke, that is the first stroke that somebody has, happens about every 19 minutes in Australia. And then 40% of those people who have a stroke tend to have another stroke within 10 years. So it happens a lot, about 27,000 people. And affects far more people and kills far more people than women are killed by breast cancer or men by prostate. So the good thing is that 80% of strokes are preventable. And prevention in medicine is so much cheaper than treatment. And any of you with a medical background would agree with me, I'm sure, on that. There are two types of stroke. And one is due to um, a blockage. And that can be um, down to um, a blood clot in the blood vessel in the brain. If that happens somewhere else, it's got a different name. But we call it a stroke because when it happens in the brain, it's a bit like being struck by lightning. It's sudden. It's not a gradual accumulation of um, symptoms unless you have had a series of TIAs, which I'll have a chat about in a minute. So it could be a blockage. Now, when that blood is blocked, then the brain cells start to die. And they can die at a rate of about, or up to 1.9 million brain cells in a minute. Now, if you ask any of my kids, they probably would have said I didn't have that many to start with. <laughs> However, you do, you have billions of brain cells and you don't use very many of them in the general run of things. But that blockage means that part of your brain, about the size of a green pea, this is just blue tack, one day I'm going to get hold of my great-grandchildren's plasticine and get some that look more like pea, one of those every 12 minutes. That means that time's really important. And if that doesn't sound as if time's really important, because one in 12 minutes isn't a lot of your brain, after all, but that's that many in an hour. So that much of a brain has died in an hour. And if you live in the country and you don't have access to immediate transport to hospital and immediate response at a place like the Royal Adelaide, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, their throat unit works. It could take four hours for you to get somewhere where you can be treated. So that's 20 green peas worth of brain, which has now come to be pretty well a handful. Now have a look at your brain skull and you'll realise that a handful of brain is quite a bit of brain. So we really do need to be careful about our brains and look after them. Now, the other thing that can happen is bleed. And bleeds are generally the result of high blood pressure, but they can be the result of other things as well. And they're not the result of trauma. So if you have a trauma in your brain, so you've just had a concussion because you've been clawed in a footy match, that happens because the soft tissue of your brain has hit the inside of the skull, which stops more quickly than the soft tissue. But this happens inside your brain and is far more serious. So a blockage, or a bleed. Now, often a doctor won't say that you've had a stroke because they tend to use more medical terms. 
But this is a layman's talk or a layperson's talk for lay people. If you are a person in the medical profession and you want to correct what I say, feel free. The way to think about how to respond to a stroke is to think about this acronym. F stands for face. Had something gone wrong with the person's face that wasn't there before? This is a really good test because you don't have to undress anybody to see whether there's anything wrong with them. You can see it in front of you. So has the mouth drooped? Has one eye suddenly closed? The, if that's the case, what you do is you dial triple zero and you show the people at the other end that you think the person with you has had a stroke. And it's really important to start your conversation that way. That will alert the whole of the system to know that this is a medical emergency. So, something wrong with the person's face? Or it could be that there's something wrong with their arm. Maybe they reached out, as a friend of mine did, to pick up a drink, and they couldn't pick it up. So they could reach out, but they couldn't pick the cup up. Or it could be that somebody's holding on to a great-grandchild or a grandchild and drops them. They wouldn't normally do that. Something's gone wrong very suddenly. Call people <coughs> zero. Sometimes, and these are the most common symptoms of a stroke, sometimes there's something wrong with a person's speech. In fact, this is one of the most common. And it could be that the person's speech is slurred so that they sound drunk. It could be that they don't appear to understand. And this is so frustrating because often inside the person's brain they do understand but they can't get the message out. And this is a warning to anybody who deals with somebody who doesn't look as if they're understanding. Remember that they might understand you. I've been with people who've recovered after a road accident and heard first responders say, don't think there's much help for this life. Mm -hmm. So they do register what you're talking about. So be kind. And the most important thing with any of this is to dial triple zero. If the person has such severe symptoms that they need CPR, the people on the other end of the phone will tell you what to do. If the person needs to be put into the recovery position, then the person at the other end of the phone will tell you what to do. They are terrific at responding to people who are in a state of panic. And believe you me, I know they could because I've had to call, not for stroke, but for other things. So, any of these things, time is of the essence. So don't say, I'll see how you are in half an hour. Don't say, oh, let's have a cup of tea and then see how you are. Don't give them anything to eat or drink. Just go for the ambulance triple zero, wherever you are. <clears throat> so what's this got to do with prevention? Well, your stroke risk is related to who you are, and that can be about getting older, particularly male. Males are more likely to have a stroke than females, and I don't want a question about that because I don't know why. But <laughs> men are more likely to have a stroke. <laughs> If you have a family history of stroke, then you've got a higher risk of having a stroke. It's not hereditary, but there is a higher risk. And this leads us to all the things that we don't know. Remember that American politician who said there's the things that we don't know and then the things that we don't know that we don't know? Well, we need money for research because the more we find out about what we don't know now, then the more lives we're going to be able to save, both in prevention and also in terms of treatment. So if you come from a, an, an Indian or a South Asian background or a Pacific background, or you are an Indigenous Australian, you are more likely to have a stroke than if you come from Europe. 
So there's a difference there, but we don't know why. If you've already had a stroke, then you're more likely to have another one. And the same with the GIA. So I said I was going to talk about a GIA. A GIA is a blockage which breaks up. So a person will have all the symptoms of a stroke or any of the symptoms that they've got. And then sometimes, only seconds later, sometimes hours later, they will say, oh, I feel better now. And this is a bit dangerous because it means that sometimes we fail or cancel the ambulance or we won't bother. But a TIA is still a stroke. It's just that that conglomeration of blood clots has been broken up by the pressure of the blood beating up against it. And it's broken up, which means all those little bits are now floating around the system, waiting to reaccumulate. So you really do need to get that person to hospital. And it's called a TIA because it's transient. I listened to a journalist talking about how he felt after he had a major stroke. And what you do is you sit down in the hospital and the doctors start to ask about your history. And they said to him, have you had any signs or symptoms? And he said, no, nothing's fine. And then he started to think. And he realised that there had been times in the previous 12 months when he had reached out to do something on his computer, and let's face it, a computer is basically an extension of a journalist's hand, and he looked down and he thought, I don't know what to do. And then within 30 seconds, the feeling had gone. And that happened a few times before he had his major stroke. And when the doctors heard that, they said, yep, you had a series of TIAs. But when we feel funny, when we feel different, when we have an episode, we're so inclined to put it aside. <coughs> but don't put it aside. It's really important to watch how your body and your brain is working. So this 80% of strokes that can be prevented, at one every 19 minutes, that comes down to 100 in about 32 hours in Australia. So if we could prevent 80% of them, we could get it down to 20 in 32 hours. Just think about what we say. Forget money for a start. Just think in terms of relationships and quality of life. And children knowing their parents or their grandparents. And then you can start to think about money in the cost-benefit analysis of today's world and think that's a lot less ambulance calls and that's a lot less emergency meetings and a lot less operations or treatment and then go on to rehabilitation. It would save an enormous amount of grief. So how can we do that? Well, what I'd like you to do is make time for a health check. There is a check which is on the Medi care system, which is called a heart check, but it's actually a cardiovascular check, so it includes the brain. And they will check if you are over 40, they'll give you a good checkup and they'll go through lots of things to question you about and work out whether you are likely to have a, check, a stroke in the next five years or so. Because some of the things that contribute to people having a stroke are high blood pressure, and along with that is stress and alcohol consumption, because both of those contribute to high blood pressure. High blood cholesterol, which you can manage if you're given good advice, not just medically, but also by choosing your lifestyle better. And then type two, try that again. Type two diabetes is also a risk factor, but if it's managed well, then the risk of having a stroke is reduced. And irregular heartbeat, which is usually referred to as AF. If you have any of these things, you need to be constantly in touch with a doctor that you trust. And there's a fair few blokes in here today. 
and blokes are not good at looking after themselves. Statistically, I'm not biased, but statistically, you will find that men turn up at a doctor's later than women do. Why? I suspect it's because women are used to being poked and prodded all their lives. And so they just say, I'll go and talk to a doctor about it. Men, who when they have a cold, will tell you they've got the flu, <laughs> when they've got something serious, think, oh, I better not complain. I've got to be tough. I've got to not be your mute. Until they peel over completely. So, blokes, take a breath, talk to the doctor, and be honest. I took my partner to the doctor, and his words to the doctor were, you know what Janet's like, she makes a fuss. But I wasn't making a fuss. He really did need to see a doctor. And so, if you get in early, you're more likely to find out about the things that are going to trip you up, as it were. Then you need to take control of your own health. How can you do that? Well, you can eat well. That doesn't mean a lot. And it doesn't mean it matters either. <laughs> what it means is that you eat fresh and you minimise the extra salt, sugar, fat that you don't need. And just as a word of warning, if you have to tear something open to eat it, you probably didn't need it, and it won't help you even if you do eat it. So that's not a bad thing to keep in mind. If it's fresh, now, look at this. Somebody over here offered me a cucumber. He grows them. And you know what? He's not only healthier because he grows them, he's healthier because he probably eats out of his backyard as well. And I've been eating backyard peaches this week and they outclass anything you're going to find in any of the big shops. Stay active. Normally, when I was giving an ordinary talk, not just to Rotarians who don't like long talks, I would get you to stand up and have a wriggle. But try to do it. No matter what you do, you try to be active every hour. And that will help the blood flow and help your body. Avoid alcohol. Now, Australians are fatally addicted to alcohol. You only have to look at our road deaths to know how alcohol has an effect on life. But they, alcohol also increases your risk of having a stroke. So if you value your brain, I'm not asking you to give it up because I know it's addictive. Have a glass of water between each standard drink and drink all the water. Give your liver a chance to recover and get rid of what you've already put in your body and drink no more than 10 standard drinks a week and have two alcohol-free days. That's the recommendation for somebody who is healthy. If you've got problems, drink less. Now I can see blokes looking at each other and laughing. And that's the problem with our society. We don't like to be told that something we like isn't actually good for us. Think back to a four-year-old. And then smoking. You know, when I first started work, which is quite a long time ago, people smoked everywhere. In pubs, in clubs, in the cars, at school, in the bike shed, wherever. And I don't know how we did it, but we managed to get both sides of our parliamentary system decide that they would do something about it. And they reduced the rate of smoking significantly. And they reduced the places where people smoked significantly. And now they're starting to work on vaping. And when you have 12 year olds coughing up blood because of vaping, and yet the same people who told us that tobacco was safe, telling us that vaping is safe, then we need another system in place. So all of those things will make you healthier. Okay, so what's the advantage of being healthy? Well, first of all, you're less likely to have a stroke. You're probably more likely to be happier in old age. Because when you're old and sick, 
not as easy to be old and happy. And I'd rather be old and happy than old and sick and miserable. So, oh, press the wrong button. So, if you wanted to get involved, I've got a donation envelope there for any individual. I know that the club is fully committed. And you can share the fact that we do give talks to other clubs. And if you belong to other clubs, I can give you a contact number for you to contact. Um, and share what you've heard today. You know, when my granddaughter was 14, she was with her auntie when she had a stroke while she was driving. And my granddaughter knew that I gave talks about stroke, but I've never talked to her. And it was amazing that they actually got home and then her uncle told her to ring the ambulance. Now, if you share the information with somebody younger, they might save your life. So it's not worth, well worth knowing that sharing information is good. Okay, I don't know how I'm going to time, but any questions? <laughs> Either I've put you to sleep or I've stunned you. We've got time for a couple of questions. Okay. What's the, despite the, um, I spoke originally not English, um, what's the difference between a heart attack and a stroke? Because it's like the, in some sense, like language wise, we tend to join these similar words. Okay, stroke only happens in your brain or in the brain stem. A heart attack happens in your heart. And that, it sounds stupid, but that is as simple as it is. If you get a blood clot lodged in your heart, you're having a heart attack. If you get a blood clot lodged in your leg, you're having something to do with DVD, I think it's called. And if it happens in your brain, you're having a stroke. Okay, but same symptoms, same... Not necessarily, no. You're more likely to drop dead of a heart attack. You can drop dead of a stroke too. But, you know, the thing is that I'm not versed in heart attacks. Okay, so I can't say any more than that. Yes? What's your advice to somebody who lives alone? Um, come to me. Um, okay, it's not a silly question because if you're alone and have a stroke and you can't speak clearly, then what you need to have is some form of alarm system which you wear so that you're not like people who get out and then forget that they should have it on. There are lots of services that provide that, but at least if you can press something, even if you can't speak and it's an emergency call, that can start. Um, but the other thing is to make sure that the ambulance service knows how to get in your house. Because if you live in a house that's got a key service thing, then they need to know the code so that they can get the key and get in your house. If they can't get in your house, they can't help you. So two things, be proactive, proactive in both of those and you're more likely to be better off. Okay, another question? Yes, hang on. Two, two comments. One, if you live with a partner and you're there, make sure you have your hearing aid in. <laughs> Another thing that's wrong with having um, deadlocks on front doors is that um, have a security screen, but don't deadlock the front door. Um, but yeah, it is important that you wear a hearing aid, and I know how important it is, quite apart from the fact that when the wife's talking, it can turn the rotten things off. But also um, because 
we present you with two Adelaide Rotary Adelaide books, um, 100 Not Out, and the Rotary Club of Adelaide Centenary History Book. Um, all funds raised today, Jeanette, go directly to supporting um, Adelaide Rotary's community and youth projects. Members, please stand and join me in thanking Jeanette for a very uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you. 